Welcome back, everyone. We are in our next session. It's 2 p.m. Eastern time, and we are going to be meeting with Dr. Tara McCannell. So we're going to be hearing about uh, some issues from the perspective of an oncologist. Doc, little, a little bit more about Tara. So Dr. Tara McCannell, the director of the Ophthalmolic Oncology Center at UCLA Stein Eye Institute of the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California in LA, uh, Dr. McCannell is a leader in the field of ophthalmology and diseases of retina and vitreous. I'm learning so many technical and medical terms today. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to, to have her come to stage here. She's pioneered new surgical treatment strategies in ocular melanoma that are both vision saving and that provide patients with more knowledge about their cancer. And we're honored to be joined with uh, Dr. McCandle today. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring her to stage. And let's give everyone, give her a warm welcome in the chat here. Let's give some emojis, fire, applause, some happy faces here as we bring Dr. McCandle to stage. Hey, well, thank you so much. Um, you know, I this is a real honor to give a talk on something that I don't usually speak on. Um, you know, I do, I help people and see patients with ocular melanoma from the more clinical side, but I really was speaking about what happens when a diagnosis of ocular melanoma or any cancer for that matter is given. And, you know, from the perspective of the eye doctor, you know, we always are in this position where we're giving this very negative news to people. And over the years in my practice, um, I've really sort of learned to see how people respond and try to help people through this journey that they're about to begin. And I'd like to share some of my experience. Um, why don't we advance the slide? Um, so I'm going to give you a little introduction about myself. Um, I want to talk about why the word cancer is so heavy and and, and, and such a blow when people hear it. Um, I want to share with you a little bit about my collaboration with the health psychology department at UCLA. I want to point out a few research findings that I think are really important for people to know about so that they can better tackle this cancer journey. And then I'm going to give you a few pointers that I thought might be helpful in terms of, of coping with this. So um, a little bit about me. I've been at UCLA and the Director of Ocular Oncology for a little over 16 years. And I've been privileged to be in a position where I have all this experience and people come to me who really know nothing and are frightened and it's up to me to help you on your journey, to share with you what I know and to make sure that you're not missing anything in this. You know about this condition, you know what to expect, that there are no surprises and it's my goal to make sure my, my patients know as much about this problem as I do because people do better the more they know. And this is sort of going to be a repetitive theme in, in this presentation. You know, for me, being in this career has been really amazing. And just like everything in life, especially recently, you never know what's around the corner. And when I started off in ocular oncology, my focus was really on looking at the genetics, looking at, you know, working with my laboratory, coming up with new genes that might relate to cancer progression and risk of cancer metastasis. And I spent a lot of time on that. Um, but I also dabbled in some other areas of interest. And from the beginning at UCLA, I've had the honor to work with a health psychologist um, in the Department of Psychology. And I'm going to share a little bit about um, my colleague with you, but it really was important to address what people are facing because we're not just treating a cancer or an eyeball. I mean, this affects people's whole lives. And, you know, I've seen it and lived with this through with my patients. And it's just really important to have the whole perspective. And, and I, I don't really want to share what I've learned. So please advance. So why is cancer 
such a terrible word. I mean, some people don't even use the word. In, in my family, people say, don't say that word. Say it's the C word. You know, it's just such a horrible word. It's like worse than a swear word. And, and I think it's because when people think of cancer, these, these horrible images flash through their mind. They think inevitable death. You know, now I have cancer, now I'm going to die. Um, in, relate, in regards to ocular melanoma, when people think of cancer, they think it's in my eye. I'm going to lose my eye. I'm going to go blind. The world is going to become black. It's just, it's just, I can't, it's just unfathomable. And then I think a really big part of the word cancer that, that is harmful and, and really messes with people is uncertainty. You know, what do I have? Um, what's going to happen to me? And how am I going to recover? And what's going to happen to my body? And, and a lot of times we can't always predict what's going to happen. And, and this is very frightening for people. And, and I've, I've realized that this whole you know, managing uncertainty is, is really what we have to do in our lives. And it really comes into play when we have this disease that we sort of know what goes on, but there's still so much about ocular melanoma that we cannot predict. And, and that is, it's just, it, you know, like, why does it go to the liver? I mean, nobody knows, you know, we have a lot of theories, um, but it's just completely beyond us. And so uncertainty is, it just, it just, difficult for us and uncertainty causes stress and it it, it it really percolates into other areas of our lives and I think with cancer um, there's this with the uncertainty and hearing about a rare diagnosis there's this idea of lack of control and um, as soon as we're in a situation where we feel like we don't know what's going to happen something might happen to us or there's a possibility of outcomes that we can't predict it's very frightening and all this fear it just it makes getting a diagnosis like this just one of the it's one of the worst things and and people have told me that it's the worst day of my life when i learned about this um and i think as you know coming from a, a doctor perspective there's a lot of things that can be done up front to really make this less frightening to give some certainty and to allow people to start on this journey on a good foot, not in, in an utter confusion and, and, and um, you know, being completely lost and, and, and feeling like it's absolutely horrible. Because it is horrible. And, you know, I think that, if anything, this, our whole pandemic, you know, when you look at the list of, of things on this, on this slide, you know, um, I know people who have died, you know, um, people have had illnesses that we've never heard of. There's all this uncertainty. I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen in the next couple months in our lives. And I think you know, there's, there's other areas in our lives that mirror this. But I think cancer has this really negative, um, this really negative perspective to it that it's difficult for people. Um, please advance the slide. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, my my most favorite collaborator who I do research with, and this is uh, Professor Annette Stanton. Um, Annette, I met Annette when I first started UCLA. I reached out to her and just said, can we do some work together? You know, this is a, a rare cancer and we don't really know a lot about what how people cope with the cancer. There's these new genetic markers and I really wanna make sure that we're not missing anything in our research. So I've, I've known Annette forever since I've been at UCLA and she's now the chair of the Department of Psychology. And she has an impressive research record um, and has published extensively in health psychology and breast cancer and pancreatic cancer and more recently with me in ocular melanoma. And she's just such a wealth of information and I've learned so much about how to track outcomes, how to record psychological data, and how it takes a long time to process all this, but it is so important. Um, so I really give significant acknowledgement to Annette, who has been with me. I've had the opportunity to work with her students. Um, I, I helped oversee one of her PhD students a few years ago, and there's just constant excitement when, when working with a, an amazing colleague. Why don't you advance the slide, please? I want to share with you some of the research findings in a few of our key papers. And um, way back in the beginning, when we began 
offering prognostic biopsy to patients, this was an incredibly controversial topic. And many of you know that there are ocular oncologists who are a little reluctant to, to do the biopsy because they feel that it doesn't really change the medical management. Um, and when I began doing prognostic biopsy and talking about it at our um, medical meetings, I mean, it, the reaction to me was was really harsh. I mean, it was like people throwing tomatoes at me. I mean, not literally, but it was, you know, what are you doing? You're 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 sticking a needle in there, and why is this information even important? Because we don't have a cure for this. And I just thought, you know, I think that people would want to know. And so the first paper that I published with Annette, and what we looked at was we wanted to answer the question: Do people want to know if there was a test where you could get information about your metastatic risk? Um, we want that information, even if it might not affect your medical diagnosis. And the overwhelming answer we found when we looked at this was yes. And and it really it's important to realize that information, which is you know how what is the nature of your cancer, is critically important as part of the pieces that you need to gather together to go forward. You know whether it's good information or it's 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 information where there's high risk. You know. Knowing that really gives people the power to make changes in their lives and to move forward with decisions. And I find this is very hard to transmit to the medical community, um, but, you know, it's important. People want this information. We have to provide it if there's a way. And we do indeed have a way. And I think over the recent years, offering biopsy has really become standard of care. And and I'm, I'm so pleased that we're in a place than we were 10 years ago. Um, and I hope that we continue. Advance, please. Um, so the, the paper isn't, oh, here we are. So we also looked at qu specific quality of life variables in people who have ocular melanoma. And it was, it was sort of more of a survey because no one had really looked at this before. Um, and we found that the factors that affect quality of life, and you, you may hear this term, quality of life, this, quality of life, that, we want good quality of life. I kind of think of quality of life as, you know, what do we need to do to enjoy our lives? You know, what do people like to do? What what can we do to make life a, a, an enjoyable experience? And, and anything can contribute to that, I think, is quality of life, and it's really vitally important. And a lot of times quality of life research is a little bit underplayed because we don't think of it as cutting edge science, but it's really essentially the essence of our lives. What do we need to do so we can enjoy ourselves? You know, this is really fundamental. And so we found that in, in ocular melanoma, there's different people who have cancer in ocular melanoma have different factors which influence their quality of life. And one of the things that came out of this research is that people who have ocular melanoma actually have higher levels of quality of life than other types of cancer. And you can imagine with, with eye melanoma, we're dealing with a smaller organ um, and it, it, it tends to affect overall function less than if you had a, a cancer that affected a larger organ in the body, for example. Please advance. Give me one moment. I'm going to just pause to make to say. Right. And so um, the more a more recent study that we did, this came out a couple years ago, was a prospective study where we gathered information from patients before they started their treatment and, and really their journey into cancer. And this is data that was collected over three or three to four year period um, and then analyzed. And um, basically we wanted to find out what are the factors that correlate with good psychological health. So we looked at things like depressive symptoms and, you know, looking at um, features that predict depression are really helpful to convey when people are not doing well with their diagnosis. And so a few things were very important. People who did well at the end of one year after the diagnosis shared two important characteristics. Number one, information. So the more information a person had from the beginning and throughout their first year the better they did in terms of 
doing well. So we found that people who, who felt they didn't have enough information about their condition did more poorly. So it's critical that people get educated and learn about this. They learn all about ocular melanoma, understand their treatments, know as much as possible about this cancer. And, and a forum such as a Cure Insight is a wonderful place to make sure that you're up to date on everything that can be. And the second factor we found that was important that predicted how well people do is the social support. Do you have people around you that you can lean on? Do you have family members and loved ones who you can go to for support and to talk about what you're going through as you start this journey? We found that people who had fewer social supports did not do well in terms of, of depressive symptoms. There was more signs of depression that we found. And so what's really important is these two things, educate yourself, cultivate and establish relationships with others you know when, when I, I i kind of um there was a lecture i went to last summer about what predicts happiness and and this this individual went through all these different factors and really the number one thing is the friends you have the people in your life so this is vitally important and and it's something that we need to work on all of us no matter where you come from but it is very important for emotional health next slide please So over the summer, um, we've, we've finished a paper that is going to be published in the Journal of Behavior um, and, sorry, I think the Journal of Psychological Behavior. And it's, a, it's an article where we look at called benefit finding. And I had not heard of this term before, but benefit finding in the psychology literature is a very described term. Um, actually, Professor Stanton herself has published a number of papers um, in the past decade in different cancers on the role of benefit finding. So what is benefit finding? It sounds a little contradictory, but benefit finding is when you have, you undergo a stressful or traumatic experience and you're able to, you're able to grow from it. You've, something good came out of this. Um, and it's considered a favorable outcome, particularly in the setting of cancer. So, you know, an example might be, you know, say that you you found out that you had a, a terminal cancer and there wasn't much time. You didn't know how much time you had, but, you know, one of the things that you decided to do was to leave a bad relationship or quit a job that was not bringing you any satisfaction or joy. And after doing these actions, you were in a better place. So that might be an example of benefit finding, but obviously it's very personal. Um, and so a, a good outcome of benefit finding would be sort of an increased appreciation in life, um, as well as maybe strengthened social relationships. And so these are good things that can happen. And so this study found that when people used what's called approach-oriented coping, which means you just get in there and you face the issue, you deal with things and, and you move forward. That was associated with greater benefit. And people who used a more avoidant style, which, you know, to, to kind of translate that would be people who sort of maybe didn't really, they realized that they had the problem, but decided not to really look into it. And in kind of a denial, you know, to sort of um, not feeling like you just don't want to deal with it. I'll put it off. I'll, I'll just go show, I'll go to the surgery. I'll do what they say, but I don't really want to think about it. I don't want to talk to family members about it. That kind of coping was associated with less um, beneficial or, or benefit finding. And one of the things I thought was interesting was that vision, visual acuity does not have any correlation with benefit finding. So you know, of course, you want to see as well as you can, but actually some of these other factors in how you deal with getting this diagnosis are much more important than how your eyeball actually sees. Next slide, next slide, please. So some of the other work that's going on, um, I, I touched on vision. Um, we're, we're putting together a paper where we have found that a person's subjective visual function, so how well you think you see, correlates with depressive symptoms meaning good outcome, bad outcome, not your actual objective visual acuity. So, you know, when people sort of feel that they're able to do what they can and they're, they're, the effect of the cancer on their vision doesn't really, 
impact their life that much, even though their vision can be poor, those people have a better outcome. So it's not just based on what you can read an eye chart when you go to the ophthalmologist's office. Um, and so one of the things, another bit of data that I think is really fascinating is we're, we're starting to look at all the psychological inventory that we've taken over the years, and we're correlating it with patients who develop metastatic outcome. And, and that really begs the question, can we influence? And, and this is something I'm deeply passionate about and hopeful that we're going to get some answers to this, is can we influence the onset of metastasis by improving mental health? So, you know, there's, there's a lot of other correlates in other cancers um, where a person's mental health, their emotional health, affects and influences their the physiological progression of the cancer. Um, we did some preliminary unpublished work where we looked at people who developed ocular melanoma compared to people who come to our clinic without a diagnosis of cancer. And it doesn't seem like there's any psychological influence with the diagnosis of cancer, and which has actually been mirrored in other cancers. When people get cancer, there's nothing really that has to do with how your emotional state is. But how people do with cancer and recurrences and metastasis and other types of cancer do seem to be correlated with emotional and psychological health. So I, I think this is very important. And a lot of things that we can learn still about this, because we're just at the beginning of this work. Let's um, advance the slide, please. So I want to also, you know, based on what I've kind of gone through with you, I want to share some pearls on how I think it would be important to incorporate some of these points and how to cope. So you've been diagnosed, what do you do now? And I think our research supports this, but it's really important to face your cancer head on, you know? This is what it is. This is what you've been given. Now we have to go forward with it, you know, and that's just how it is. And you can do that by deciding to learn about it. You know, educate yourself. Um, the information that your doctor may give you, supplement it. Go to the internet, find resources, question your doctor. You know, if something doesn't seem to make sense or you don't understand it, figure it out. You know, take the time to really engage in it. You know, um, it's just, really become the most educated person you can because you're really you're your own health advocate and you can help others with doing this as well we have a number of our patients who um, are contacted if a person has a new diagnosis and you can share your experience and how you've done this and it, it can have significant impact on somebody else and so i mentioned um with one of our research uh results social relationships are really important. So start today, cultivate and lean on your social network. You know, if there's somebody that you really like and you're, you're, you want to establish a friendship with, start now. You know, don't wait till there's more time. Social connectedness is, we need that every day and, and all of us, no matter what our situation is. And it's vitally important to, to a better health outcome when you have close relationships you know you have a network of those people you can lean on, you can express yourself to, and, and, and really have in your life to have a positive influence. Um, I, wanted, I want to touch on something we haven't really focused in research on, but um, focusing on optimism and gratitude. And, and I think there's sort of a similarity with benefit finding, you know, a greater appreciation for the things that you do have. But I've done a lot of reading and talking to people about the role of gratitude in in our lives. And um, it's really important to to sort of be thankful and appreciate all the things that we do have. You know, for example, thinking, you know, I have a doctor I can go to. Um, uh, the health care that I'm receiving is 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 accessible to me. I'm not in a in a place where nobody knows what they're talking about. I can I can I have resources. I've been able to find things to help me. And optimism is a little different than gratitude, but optimism is is, is as you know is sort of taking taking the positive look at things. And I think as healthcare providers, um, making sure that we look at the bright side because in every situation there's always a silver lining, no matter how horrible a situation we may find ourselves in, there's, there's always a way to look at what's good about the situation. 
And I think that we, we need to think about that, even how we give information. Um, you know, when, when people come to me and we're talking about the diagnosis of melanoma, I frequently hear, you know, how how the doctor who sent them talked to them about it. And it was it was really upsetting. And I think that it's 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 important to be hopeful because there's always a good outcome possible in, in, in any of this. And I also think that, you know, people need to decide on, they need to decide and figure out how you're going to respond. And I find that because we are often in such a shock when this happens, we kind of let others guide us. We let other people, you know, we, the words that other people use, we sort of internalize them because we just don't have it in us to sort of to, to be resilient and say, you know, that doesn't make sense. Um, we, we're just, but it's important to realize that, you know, you don't have to accept the negative view that your doctor presented to you when they said, well, you know, your situation isn't looking good. Um, you know, a lot of times I, f I find that ophthalmologists will, will focus on, you know, your tumor is in the macula, bad news. When in reality, if you have a small tumor in the macula, you still have 80 to 85 percent of the rest of your retina that's going to give you good vision and then and and you know approaching things from a positive way really gives you more energy to move forward and and to continue on this so i say throw out ideas you don't like like you can only you 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 can't see with one eye you know and i think that is so incorrect you know as a retina specialist most of my practice has a the individuals have one eye that's just not as good for a number of reasons. And I would say that the vast majority of people are living great lives. They're doing things. They're active, engaged in sports. Um, I mean, there's so many things you can do with one eye. And I think, you know, you don't have to have that idea in your head. And this, you know, when a doctor says to you, you will probably die of metastatic disease. You know, nobody knows what we're going to die of. I mean, you know, it could be coronavirus. I mean, it could be anything. So, you know, you don't have to accept the views that come from people around you if it doesn't fit with you. And let's advance to the, the last slide. And I, I just have a couple of final thoughts that I, I want to share just to kind of summarize. So, you know, in life, we can't control what happens to us but we can decide how to respond to everything that happens. And I think we really have to remember that, you know, no matter where you're coming from. And I heard a, a that I really liked um, because I often don't get what I like. I've learned to like what I get. And I think this is, this touches a bit on the importance of gratitude in sort of giving you an optimistic perspective on life. And optimism really opens up all kinds of things that that will bring goodness to your lives as opposed to taking a more pessimistic approach. So, you know, to summarize, I, I just think that even though this is a very hard diagnosis to receive and it's the beginning of a whole change in your lives, there's still there's still good things out there. And there's we need to remember that and and know that the more you focus on positives, the more that you empower yourself and work and cultivate your network of support system, this is what determines a good outcome. And, and you know, in the future, making the best of whatever it is that you're given. And so I thank you for your attention and I'm more than happy to hear comments, um, answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinnell. So I, your positivity is radiating, by the way. I know that you, you said you're like in a small place. <laughs> I'm in my That was, that was really amazing. And so we have a couple of questions. You have tons of comments. Um, sure. you know, you're hundred percent correct. And my monitor's on this side. So I'm not trying to not look, look directly at you, but facing cancer head on and an optimistic attitude is very important to fight with cancer. Um, Excellent, positive talk, gratitude, and optimism. You are the best, Winky <laughs> Face. The uh, from Lori Walters. The journey is so hard, but yet you you help and always want to thank you. You can definitely live with one eye. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, there, I have one question here, and and if you have more questions, please drop them in the Q and A. That way, we can export those questions later to um, kind of look at. Would you recommend all patients with ocular melanoma? Um, seek out an oncology psychologist? 
Um, you know, I think that's a great question. And I, if there is such a person who has experience with, you know, I, I just don't know enough about seeking professional psychological therapy and help. Um, but I think that there's an oncologist, psychologist who has that expertise, I think that would be incredible. Um, I strongly believe that your emotional and mental health um, needs to be worked on just as much as your physical health. And there are, I know there are people out there with expertise who can really work with you and do a deep dive into your your emotional past. I mean, whatever whatever you come to the table with, okay. there's always stuff that needs that needs help and that can be improved. And that maybe there's things to come to terms with that if you do, you're going to be healthier as a result. So, I, I would love to hear about such an individual. I'm I'm not aware of any, but if if you have access to someone like that, that would be amazing. So I would strongly encourage it. So if you, if someone were to look for an oncology psychologist, I mean, is that like a specialty thing that, that um, exists? Yeah, there's several that um, around the country. Is it, is that something that someone goes to school for um, or is it generally a medical I, psychologist? Yeah. I, I just don't know enough about, about that. I know that there are a lot of psychologists who do work in oncology and maybe focus on patients with cancer. Mm -hmm. um, but, the field of psychology is so broad, but I will, I will actually look into that. I'm really, you know, that's actually a really fascinating thought. We should have good resources and experts who could help people with that. Um, because I'm just not really aware, but great question. And Lori Walters says UCLA has a cancer sociologist. What's the difference between a sociologist and a psychologist? So <laughs> I don't want to, I'm not going to try to step on any toes here. I'm not, I'm not exactly the degree and study is different. Um, so sociologist, I think, is, is slightly different training, whereas a psychologist often has a, a clinical component. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of overlap and, you know, it really comes down to the individual and their experience. So um, you could have someone with maybe less degrees in training, but who has a lot of experience working in a certain area. So I think if and explore this, it would be good to to meet the few individuals and find out mm. what seems to be a good fit for you. Okay. And are there, and, and I would love some re re uh, resources from anyone in the audience here, because we do have about 10 minutes if we have uh, more questions. And if we run out of questions, and of course, um, we can always do a little bit more networking so people can meet you um, at the tables that we have here. Um, but is there are there um, specific groups that people can join? I know that obviously a Karen site has a really large community of people that that work with them. Um, but in your specific practice, do you do you, are there like support groups for OM patients that that they can join? Is that something that they have? So we we really rely on the larger organizations like mm -hmm. a Karen a, a Karen site and the. Um, you know, Ocular Melanoma Research Foundation, I think they have really established programs where I know that there's the, the MR, um, the, the Cure OMF has a, a buddy system where you can sign up and there's actually very formal training because I think it's important to, when a person reaches out to a stranger that they've never met before, that, that you know, there's a certain, there's a program, there's formality. Um, right. And I, I know that some organizations do that. At UCLA, we don't actually, we have not created a formal network, although we do have some patients who, you know, what actually happens is that just people in the waiting room chat, talk to each other. There's been amazing friendships forged between patients um, who, who now they come together and things like that. But I think the, the larger organizations have a really good handle on it. Okay. And I know that um, uh, in my experience, there's been a couple of um, friends that I have or family that have also had like patient advocates. And I guess that sometimes they can be helpful uh, too with, with referring some of those things um, in, you know, whether it's covered by insurance and whether it's not, I think that's kind of the question. But um, I know that we have here, Lisa says that local cancer support groups in nearby hospitals can be very helpful. And I, I think that's entirely true. That's definitely true. So let's see here. Um, and then a cure insight has something called 
Dure companies, D-U-R-E companies. Um, so I definitely suggest, so all of our ACIS board members are attending this event. Lori Walters, Melody Burchett, we have uh, Lauren Seaman who is here, um, and there's some others that are on uh, Cure Companies. I was like, man, that's a really strange word. Cure Companies, C-U-R-E, Cure Companies is something that um, a Cure Insight has. Cure Companions, Companions, C-U-R-E, Companions. That is what it's called. <laughs> we'll make sure we have that corrected there. And, and Melody, if you want to send me some information about that, we can get that out to everyone. And um, does anyone else have any more questions? Do you have any more thoughts or things you'd like to, to tell people? I know that just for reference of, of attendance, we have um, over 200 attendees. In this particular session, we have 45 right now. Um, there's anywhere from patients, survivors. Um, we have physicians, uh, advocates that are on here. So if you could give some advice for anyone who has been diagnosed, diagnosed and they're moving through their first processes, processes of finding out, or maybe they've had a change in diagnosis, what's, what's some advice that you would give them? Well, I think number one is, is just to, you know, learn as much as you can. Read the materials, go to resources. Um, all of these organizations that we mentioned have, have pages that you can learn about things. Um, and, and just, you really take some time to just, just to fill in all the gaps, like learn about the eyeball. Learn, I mean, it's, you know, it's probably an area of the body that people haven't spent a lot of time thinking about, but try to understand what it is that, you know, what parts of the eye, I mean, from even, even just very specifically, you know, what, what is affected by the treatment, what gets treated, you know, how does the surgery work? You know, I find that a lot of people, even after, um, still a lot of our patients just assume that we took the eye out and put it on a table and did a lot of work to it and then put it back. And, you know, it's, there's, I think once you understand a little bit more about just even the basics of how things work and, and why we do what we do, it, it, it really makes it less scary. And, and I feel that, you know, especially you know, it's, nowadays, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to get good information online. I think there's a lot of reliable sources mm -hmm. and just learning about you know, 10 different anatomical parts of the eye can, can really just make it all make sense. And, and, you know, and then for example, like when you're at a doctor's visit and they're doing all these different tests, you, you actually know why we're doing what we're doing. You know, there's like, why I, they always do this to me. I wonder why. I mean, if you just, if you knew that we're actually, gonna, we're looking at your macula, we're looking at the circulation because sometimes vessels can get affected. Um, even just knowing that, just makes it just makes it so much more enjoyable even to know to, to that people are looking for these things and um, so really learning um, and ask questions I think that um, a lot of times we just don't you know no silly strange or, or, or crazy question I mean you know I think it's just important to you know your doctors are there to help you and they Will probably know more than you do about certain aspects of this and you got to ask them you got to pick their brains mm -hmm. um if they don't know then you know there's there's oftentimes you know everybody's office i find has individuals help answering questions you know use the resources and find out you know because if say that you're in a situation and you're just you're not getting answers or your doctor's not listening to you i mean you got to make some noise because, you know, doctors are there for you. You know, there's really, it's really as simple as that. And, and if, if they can't help you or offer something, I mean, they need to know that you need that. And I think, um, I feel like really in the last 20 years, I mean, people are really much more vocal about what they expect, what we want to know and, and, and ask if there's something that you, you feel you didn't like, you know, speak up. You know, I think, um, I think every doctor, wants to do the best they can but sometimes they might not know um what it is that they're they're lacking and and a lot of people and i'm sure myself too i don't have insight and i'm thinking here i am going on and i think this is helpful but it's not i mean you know just be open i think and then when you have a, a comfortable relationship that really helps too because um just the whole experience feels more positive because everyone's on the same page um, so all these, I know not everything can be corrected or made just so, but at least we got to, we got to, you know, work on the, these things, you know, and, and yeah. it can be a start, you know, your, your encounter with a particular doctor's practice and treatment center 
it, it affects everybody who, who is currently a patient there or who will be a patient there. So it's really important to speak up. I think it's really powerful. And I think that there's such a value in the second opinion. And, um, you know, doctors are humans too. I think that's some people forget once they're a specialist in something that they don't have <laughs> things going on in their day, just like we would. And I think that it's really important that, that you mentioned that. And a second opinion is, is always valuable. Um, even if you do agree, um, or feel comfortable, I think, uh, there's a value in, in doing that. And so, um, I appreciate you bringing that up. And then, uh, someone said, they have heard, uh, ocu the, someone, uh, Vicky says, I've heard ocular melanoma used synonymously with uveal melanoma. Are they the same? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question because they're, they're, they're used pretty interchangeably. So uveal melanoma is from a medical term includes iris, the tumors in the choroid and the tumors that are between the iris and the choroid, the uveal tissue. So when someone says ocular melanoma, um, I think we've adopted that word a lot because it's so much easier to say mm. than choroidal or even uveal. I and mean, people look at that word and don't know, but ocular people know. So um, ocular melanoma, I think, refers to, it can be iris or from the inside, from the choroid. Um, the only ocular might, you know, we don't usually, because conjunctival, sort of the superficial melanoma is 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 completely different biologically. Um, we usually don't think of that, but it actually, if you use the word in the eye. So these are just little differences, but I think essentially they're the same. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, I really appreciate your time today, and I know everybody else has too. Um, and if you have any takeaways from this, make sure you put it in the chat and tell Tara how much we love her and how much we thank you for for spending some time doing this. And um, I do want to mention that Melody mentioned in the chat that ACIS, Acure Insight, has a Zoom meeting every Tuesday night at 7 p.m., and she's in Eastern time. So oh, wow. um, that's, that's great. I know that I've met a ton of um, uh, people that are uh, experiencing a lot of the same things or they have a lot of the same stories and it's been really pow powerful and we're honored to be here too and so I want to say thank you for coming on today and um, we're, we've got some more about Tara and Socio and her, her recording of her presentation is going to go into Socio. Um, would you be comfortable with sharing your, your presentation for that to go there also? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, well thank you so much and um, we'll be seeing you really soon. All right. Thank you so much for your help. Absolutely. Anytime. Okay, guys, we're going to go into a short break. <laughs> 